Rob Charter, welcome to Stanford and the Industrial Salama. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Rob, you're a group president at Caterpillar. What exactly mm -hmm. does that mean and what is your job at the company? Okay, um, there's five group presidents. Um, I'm one of those uh, reporting to the CEO. And my role is really uh, several. Um, I look after our independent dealer network mm -hmm. globally. So we have about 175 dealers around the world. I look after the aftermarket business on behalf of our end-to-end -end businesses, so across the organisation. Um, I look after our parts logistics, marketing, uh, digital and, and analytics group, so a variety of things. Wow, that's a pretty widespread. As you look at your channel, how is your channel changing given some of the changes of what's happening with machines and automation? How are the people that you sell through being impacted by technological innovation? I think it's like all of us. Um, they're, they're learning to adapt and change. They're getting more skill sets, particularly in the uh, digital space. Um, they're having to work in an environment like all of us that's constantly changing. And so they're evolving like uh, the, the mothership or caterpillar is um, the same way. How much are you having to guide them down the path that you want to go? You, all of us are creatures of habit. Yep. And, and, and I would argue Caterpillar puts the dust in industrialist dilemma, right? You're really mm -hmm. digging in dirt and the like. Yep. How do you bring them into a technological world which drives a lot of the products and services now that you offer to the end users? So we have a variety of sizes of dealers. We have dealers that have a uh, revenue stream of $50 million a year up to $5 billion a year, even six sometimes in, in peak years. Mm -hmm. So th there's some big companies in there and some small companies. Um, we work very closely with our dealers. Most of them are multi-generational dealers when they're private. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very close to them. Um, they're quite innovative entrepreneurs in their own right, so they do a lot of development uh, mm -hmm. in the digital space by themselves. And quite often then they rely on us to do that as well. So it's a mixture between their entrepreneurial spirit and us as, a, a, as the centre body in some respects where we need scale or where we're looking for um, some domain expertise. Um, sometimes it's us that needs to develop that technology for them. How do you think about the impact of digital and data on your business, where you're no longer just selling uh, a variety of equipment for, for a construction site or a mining site? Yep. You know, how, how will your business change over the next five to 10 years? Well, it's an interesting question, and I was thinking about this before I came in. So a lot of people don't understand. We've been in technology for a long time. For 92 years we've been a company. Um, we started our autonomy program over 30 years ago. We put our first commercial autonomy product out into the customer's hands 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And in 2012 we moved a million tonnes of ore with our customers um, in an autonomous truck. So as you think about technology, we've been in that space a long time. We have semi-autonomous machines mm -hmm. today. Uh, we, I remember back about 20 years ago, we connected our first machines um, either by satellite or cell phone. Um, so we've been doing data transfer for a long time. I think the change now is speed right? okay. and the ability to take vast amounts of data and turn that into actionable items. And I think that's what's really changing and the ability to adapt to that quickly and actually add value to your customer is the, is the big challenge we have today. So how is Caterpillar looking to use data uh, to impact your behaviours, the behaviours of the channel, or the behaviours of yep. the end user? So we, we start some, somewhat different from some other people that we compete against. Uh, in my mind, we start trying to solve customers' problems or trying to improve the customer's efficiency and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about that, the more you do that using technology, um, the more loyal they become to you, the more machines you sell, the more parts you sell, the more engines you sell and so forth. So we really, really focus on that space. Now we do that through looking at productivity, mm -hmm. um, how do we make them more produ uh, productive. And the interesting thing in technology today is if you think about productivity, you can gain like 30% uh, mm -hmm. productivity improvements where from traditional engineering you may gain 5 or 10%. Right. So it's a big, big shift. So that's one. We look at um, availability. How do we keep yep. the machines up and running? How do we do predictive and analytics to make sure that we know if something's going to break, that we have the right parts and the service people and all in the right space? So we look at all of those areas. And then we look at the customer's business in a whole and say, from a site or enterprise point of view, what tools do you need to quote better, to run your jobs better, 
and do post-mortems better so you can get better and better as you go forward. So we look at all those areas. So on the first one, do you actually get data from the machines that come back to Caterpillar that you can Absolutely. figure out best practices? Absolutely. And then when you go back to a customer, what are the types of things that you tell them to do differently based upon what you learned? So we do a, a few things in that space. It's complex, right? <laughs> so we do a few things in that space. We'll do things on board where we look at a operator's technique mm. and we, um, we analyze that and we actually can do live on board feedback to the operator to keep improving their performance okay. right there and then. We look at fuel burns, we look at cycle times, we look at idle times, we look at when they've been productive, how they're managing their fleet, are they stacking, are they not? All these sort of production elements to say how do you optimize that mm -hmm. fleet, um, we'll do that directly into dashboards back to the customers or then into insights and how to improve. Um, so we do a lot of work in that space. Yeah. In a business that's highly cyclical, right? mm -hmm. Caterpillar's always had the cyclical businesses depending upon the broader economy and right now we're going through a very tough one yep. with the fall in commodities, especially in China. How do you make sure that you have the resources to invest in a lot of these new technologies and new areas when the role of management also is to make sure the core business stays healthy and is executing? So uh, you, you teach the industrial <laughs> dilemma, right? So that's one of the hardest parts. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, what we, we've really focused on, and we've been through four years of top line degradation, which is the first time in our history, in 92 years. And, uh, and it really started with that super cycle coming out of China and, uh, and mining came off and then oil and gas came off and construction in developing countries came off, Brazil imploded. Right. So lots of things all at once, which is, which is extraordinary. Usually we have a few counter-cyclical activities. Um, what we've tried to do right through this is right size the business for what the actual business is today, um, making sure our resources are appropriately mm -hmm. structured, which has been really painful. You know, we've moved, uh, lost about 30,000 people since 2012. Um, but we've been really conscious to protect our R&D. Mm -hmm. And because if you don't protect the R&D, this cycle just extends further as you come into the up cycle and go into a new product introduction, you fall further and further behind. So we've been very, very conscious to protect that as much as we can. We've had to make some changes, but overall we've, we've really kept it intact. On the R&D side, where do you hire? And you mentioned to me earlier that you've got global R&D centers. Mm -hmm. And so you're now at the point where you're probably competing against traditional technology companies for engineering talent and, and the like. So where are you looking to add personnel and what are the skill sets that you're looking for to bring on board that maybe you didn't have before? So it's changing. I think, uh, you know, traditionally we've been very strong in mechanical engineering yeah. and those type engineering in general. So. Um, we, we hire engineers in, uh, obviously in the US um, predominantly, we also hire them in China, uh, in India, in Europe, everywhere we operate we, we bring engineers in. So we have several R&D centres around the globe for that. Um, the new skill sets we're seeing more and more of today is obviously in analytics and, and data technology. So that's something you usually don't hire normally down in Peoria, Midwest, Illinois. Um, and while we do do some there and we have great people, uh, we are also hiring in other parts of the US, including here, mm -hmm. um, and in Chicago and Dallas and all sorts of places. So we look everywhere and we're changing the way we operate to accommodate the talent and where it comes from. As your business changes, you, know, you mm -hmm. get more to this, a lot of these value-added services and the like, how do you determine what business Caterpillar should be in? versus where you need to partner? And maybe how has that changed over yeah, the last decade? And, and where do you think maybe things you need to bring in-house or now you realize you can't do it in-house and you need to have partner with the outside? So it, it's a really interesting question. And it actually applies to hard iron as much as soft iron or software, mm -hmm. right? So um, if we think it's proprietary or we think it's, it's gonna be part of our core, we bring it inside. Okay. And we can do that through acquisition or hire or organic growth. Where we're trying to, I think, learn a new skill set or a new way of doing things, quite often we'll partner in that space and we'll learn those skills because we don't have them inherently inside and it would be very hard to integrate that immediately. So we tend to partner in some of those spaces. If we don't think it's a proprietary uh, or a, if it's more commoditized, we'll certainly go outside for that. Is there anything that you say, see happening in the last few years that historically wasn't proprietary, but you think may need to be in the future because it's you know becoming a core business to what you need to serve your customer base? Um, 
I think in the digital space there's more skills there than we've had in the past. We've had a lot of skills in that, in that, that space before. I think, uh, but if you think about the way um, industrial iron or capital assets are going, the hard iron is getting dumber and mm -hmm. the computers are getting smarter. Yep. And so um, that actually shifts your focus around that the engineers that could um, invent complex valves and mm -hmm. complex plumbing, um, we make that a lot simpler so you can outsource that a lot more than you used to. And, uh, but how you control that and manage that is far more important, so you need to bring that inside. So That's you, a big difference. You recently developed, the company had a relationship with Uptake in the mm -hmm. Chicago area. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that and why did you decide to partner with Uptake? Well, to me, uh, a couple of reasons. We were looking for some solutions that we tried traditional ways many times and failed, uh, both internally and then with what I'd call more uh, normalized uh, large outside companies. Mm -hmm. So we were looking to do something different. Uh, we were looking for a small, agile, um, organization that could bring great talent together um, and we were learning we really wanted to learn a different culture mm -hmm. which we certainly did we've got a, a uh, um, Brad Keywell is a is a really dynamic guy he uh, he brings really great talent they are really of that startup mentality mm -hmm. you've got a mature company of 90, 90 odd years that's very cautious about what they do because their customers are the same customers tomorrow as they were yesterday and we have to, we have to be very uh, reliable. So you bring those two cultures together, you learn lots. So it's not easy, but it's fascinating and, and, and it's, uh, it's challenging. And I think uh, we teach a little bit about longevity and how you deliver quality product over a long period of time. He gives us agility and fresh thought and rapid approach. And so those two things have really helped us. We've learned, we've learned a lot from each other. When we had Beth Comstock from GE with us a few weeks ago, she yep. actually said this was the hardest thing that they've dealt with as an organization, oh, yeah. of being an industrial firm and then bringing in a digital mindset. What's been the biggest surprise to you as you think about the changes that you've had to internalize at Caterpillar and maybe what Uptake or others have taught you? I think uh, the speed cycle is a big thing. Mm -hmm. So doing um, sprints in two-week cycles rather than... Now we used to, and we, we're getting faster and faster because the, the world demands it, but we're used to three to five year yeah. product cycles and how do you bring that along and test and prove and perfect, hopefully. Um, but certainly the intent is to be perfect out of the box. And I think what we're learning from these companies uh, is what's a good enough product to get started, get it out in the field, iterate as you go along, do these sprints. And, that, and the mindset's different. Yeah. Um, the mindset also, some of these companies, and I'm not being specific to uptake or anyone, is how they think of their business model. Mm -hmm. We think about this sustained business model over a long period of time, a, certainly a transactional model of his value, you pay for it, where some of these companies that we've dealt with are definitely about how do I establish a value in, in the company. Now, I may not earn any money, right. but how do I establish this value? Then I can run it into an IPO and then spin it off and do it again. And that's a completely different behavior and mindset to us. So that's been interesting. <laughs> so as you think forward in the next decade, where do you think the growth, growth drivers will be for Caterpillar? What are you betting on on a go-forward basis that'll uh, continue to get back in the upswing of the organization? Um, we definitely have always been in cyclic businesses. And so we see there is an upturn in cycle that's natural that will come, uh, just in a replacement cycle. So we see that as a normal. Um, I do see that I think the continuation of speed of technology and what you can do with iron to look at the total job that the, your customer is doing and, and help them get better and better and more efficient is going to continue with us. I see a long trend for automation. Um, or semi-automation, let's say operator assist all the way to full, full automation. I think that'll continue. Um, it's just a natural. So you get less skills, less people wanting to do that type of work is going to drive to more automation. So I see that as a big change. But we see a tremendous growth in uh, the industries we serve. We're, we're in lots of industries. Um, they're all industries that are about infrastructure and improving people's lives. And we just see that is an endless 
um, opportunity around the world. So it may move from mm -hmm. country to country, but we see a great opportunity. So we're quite optimistic about the future, even through this difficult time we've been through. Do you think if you and I were sitting here in five years that your sales mix might involve more services and the selling of data services uh, to your customers or uh, you know, improvements perhaps in their actual performance and getting paid for that as opposed to just selling the iron? I think a little bit. I, I thought about this uh, a lot the other day actually. When we think about how we help a customer, in the old days we used to help a customer plan a job in paper, <laughs> plan a job, think about the equipment they use, design the job, do the job and then post-mortem. Mm -hmm. And it was a very analog, mechanical way. What we're changing to today, I think, is shrinking that time frame down and making a lot of it um, um, digital and thinking about it in a way that's uh, far more connected than it used to be. But it's, it's very similar work, it's just in a, in a different way. Yeah. So I think that's true. I, the other thing I think is because of the uh, analytics you can apply to mm -hmm. this vast amount, I mean, there's an enormous amount of data. All that data that we bring into the company, because of that, there are opportunities where you can say, I can help you in this area and this area and this area where I couldn't before, because I get insight from around the world. Um, so I do think it, it broadens into more services, but I don't think it's a pure services right. play that we want to play. I think we're really saying, we, we, we see our core as being very similar, but we expand that and we use technology to actually speed that up. Final question for you. What keeps you up at night about this transition to your products becoming more digital, information services playing a much larger role than it has in the past? You know, again, Caterpillar is a company which is at its mo most core foundation digging in the dirt. Yep. And so now you're dealing with ones and zeros and everything else. Mm -hmm. And what keeps you awake at night as you think about moving the company from where it was in the past to where it needs to be in the future? Uh, probably two things. Speed is one. I think it's, um, it moves so fast and the whole, the whole uh, process and the evolution moves much faster and how do you keep up with that and how do you keep abreast of what's coming and in the same token of speed I think that lays over to disruptive influence. Where, where are the disruptors going to come from? You know, I'll give you a great example. We have a, a network of 175 deals, they mm -hmm. have 2,200 branches around the world, we have 21 parts distribution centres, so we've got this massive network, bigger than any of our competition of how to support the product. And then you go into uh, additive manufacturing. Right. And we're, we're working very hard in that space and you, thinking about when the technology will come on to be commercially sensible to replace mm -hmm. traditional methods and how you're gonna run your business model through that. I mean, they're big questions and they really change the world. And uh, we've, we, we, we've kept abreast of that and we've gone early and then said, no, it's not ready yet. Um, picking the right time to do that and then making sure you have the business practices and the change management in place, um, they, they're things you've got to think about a lot. So Definitely interesting, interesting times. Rob Charter, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for coming to Stanford. Thank you very much.